We will be in Haggai today. Chapter 1. We'll read all of it. It's not very long. We'll be wrapping up with the uh, Minor Prophets, as I said earlier. Two more weeks. We've got two more sermons after this one. And then we will be done. We've gone through all 12 of the Minor Prophets. So Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of uh, Jozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet, prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvest little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, And the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock, on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. How are your priorities today? I'd have to say that's the one thing stubborn me just never wanted to figure out for the longest time. I would much rather not do my homework when I was in school, or clean my house, or do the dishes, or even cook, because I would much rather be lazy and destroy my budget instead of be responsible. This was college Michael, in modern Michael, if you ask Ari Ann. Listen, I am the spender, she is the saver. And if you have each of those in your marriage, you already know how that goes. But priorities are something that's really important in every single thing that we do in our lives. We have to get our priorities right. It comes in all forms and planning. So a simple example is this past Friday, it was my responsibility to take Judah up north to his grandparents' house so he could spend the weekend there. And I had to make a decision. Do I... Take him up right away. We wake up, have breakfast, let him play a little bit, hop him in the car by like 9, 9.30, head up north. Or do I take him to our local library where they're doing a story time because Judah needs to be exposed to more kids and learn how to socialize and play with kids he doesn't know and do that instead and then head up, which obviously means more work for me. It's less me time, less time for me to... Uh, relax or clean our house or, or what have you. But the right thing, the right priority is Judah and him having time to socialize with other kids. So that's what I did. But conversely, on Monday, I had several hours to myself in the afternoon when we have a babysitter come and watch Judah. I like to run errands on that day and There was a lot that I needed to get done, like uh, clean up our bedroom, fold some more clothes, keep laundry going. And did I do any of that? No. No, I did not. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't always get my priorities right. And I'm sure you can think of a number of examples from even maybe this morning. Prioritize sleeping in a little bit longer over getting up on time. Or maybe you prioritize eating a quick breakfast over a uh, more filling one. We make these judgment calls in our everyday lives. And one of the interesting things about Haggai is the priority that they were called to give and choose is one that I can understand. So let's jump into the text. What is happening? Well, Haggai is going to be a post-exile minor prophet. So if we remember our history, Israel was one nation, and then because of the foolishness of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, the, the country was split in two. The ten northern tribes became the nation of Israel. The bottom two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, became the nation of Judah. And they became split. They had okay relationships for the most part, but Israel could never figure it out. They always had altars and uh, places of worship in the high places. That means they had idols and gods that they worshipped other than, and maybe even in addition to, the God of Israel. So God brings in Assyria and crushes them. Many of them are killed. Many of them are just shipped off to Assyria. Some are left to stay, maybe tend some of the fields and the grounds and just kind of live there, but Israel is decimated. Judah hangs on for a little while longer, but even they cannot resist that siren call of idol worship. And so so Judah is eventually conquered by Babylon. Well, once Babylon is destroyed, another nation comes in and they decide, through God's prompting, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you will see God literally leads the king to say, hey, we are going to let Israel go back to their nation, go back to their homeland, go back to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple to the Lord, specifically to God himself. And so they head back, and what is the first thing they do? Well, Haggai tells us that the first thing they do is a priority I understand as a dad and as a husband. They build a house first for themselves. Listen, we can't really serve God if we don't have a place to live, right? And the thing is, we, I think, understand that in modern day. There, there's a shift in the wind uh, of Christianity that's, I think, for the most part good, and it's a slightly stronger emphasis on making sure that you are also taken care of. I remember when I was a kid, when I was younger, so several years ago, to love others meant to neglect yourself. To kind of put yourself on the back burner. Just not worry about it. Maybe you'll get to yourself eventually. But I've got to be, if I have time, I should be giving it to other people. And this was considered good. I don't agree with it. And there's a shift in Christianity where we're beginning to say, hold on. Yes, love others. But we should not love others at the expense of ourselves all the time. Sometimes, absolutely. Sometimes it's necessary to love someone else at your own expense. If you host someone or let someone live with you for a while who just needs a place to stay while they get back on their feet from a house fire or some sort of crisis, that is at your expense. Necessarily it is. But that doesn't mean you always have to say yes. That doesn't mean you dedicate every waking, breathing moment to loving someone else. And so when I read Haggai and I see... Well, they went home and they built nice houses for themselves so they had a place to sleep so they could get out there and serve God. Well, I understand that. I mean, if I I was in that time and nothing else was different about my personality and I had Arian and Judah and maybe baby number two and we were called to go back to Israel, let's go, God, we'll build your house, but can I have a roof first? And I understand that, but... What we see as we read, especially this first chapter, is they over-prioritized that paneled houses. These were nice houses. So it wasn't just, I got myself a place to live, and now we're going to build the temple. It's, I got myself a nice place to live. With maybe a nice car, and a motorcycle in the driveway, and a boat for the weekends, and maybe a camper to head out to the, to the backcountry to rest, and, and get out in the great outdoors, and maybe go hunting too, uh, for sport and fun. 
this was what God's problem was. It wasn't that they took care of themselves, though that might be what it feels like. It was that they excessively took care of themselves. This is the person who says, yes, I want to love people, but listen, I had a long day, and I couldn't possibly give to you today. How about tomorrow? And then tomorrow they say, well, no, I'm still too tired tomorrow, and they just keep pushing it off. Or they always or typically say no. This is a problem. They prioritize their home over God's house. And so Haggai, his message is not to the people in general. Rather, it's to the leader of this community, Zerubbabel, and then the high priest, the religious leader of the community, Joshua. And he told them, listen, the people's priorities are all out of whack. So much so that there's a drought, there's a borderline famine, you're hungry and tired all the time, you're not sleeping well. This isn't good. And so he calls the leaders to say, hey, lead your people well. Get out there. Tell them, hey, listen, you got a nice house. Stop. We got to get into the mountains. We got to get some timber. We got to get some gold. We got to bring it down here. And we need to rebuild the temple of God so that God has a home. Because remember, in the Old Testament, God had a physical location. The building actually mattered to an extent. And we can get into the exceptions to that, but for the most part, for Israel, God wanted to have a center of worship that the people would then spread out from. And that was Jerusalem. That was the house of the Lord. And so God's problem here is that they're not, they completely neglected God's house. Not they put it off till later. They weren't doing anything with it at all. The second problem that the people have actually comes from chapter 2. So if you go to chapter 2 of Haggai, the last chapter, starting in verse 10, we get another prophecy uh, from Haggai. So uh, chapter 2, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. This is the correct answer, by the way. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest answers, it becomes defiled. This is also the correct answer. Now, how, this is how these kinds of things worked. So let's say you had, we'll just use this uh, podium. Let's say this podium was consecrated. So oil, prayer, a priest came in here, and they said this podium is special because it has been dedicated to service for God. And then let's say on my way in, someone was injured on the side of the road, and out of compassion, I stop and I tend to their wounds, and I get blood all over my hands. I am now considered defiled, not sinful. I did the right thing. I helped someone in need, but I am defiled. And so if I were to come up here and this is now defiled, this now becomes something that must be cleansed again. This cannot be used in service to God until this is fixed. One of the crazy things that happens with Jesus and why Jesus is so radically different for, for, uh, for the Jewish mindset is that you can never take something that is consecrated for God, that is holy and set apart, and have that object or person or meat or whatever make something else holy. It never works that way. So if this podium is, is consecrated, and maybe I'm not defiled, but I'm not consecrated yet. I have to go through the hand washing, prayer, whole, whole rigmarole. If I touch this, I don't become consecrated. I don't necessarily defile this, but I don't become consecrated. But remember the story of the woman who was bleeding for 12 years in Mark. Jesus is holy. He is consecrated because he is God. Fully God and fully human. Now normally what would happen when this woman reached out 
bleeding so that made her unceremonially unclean. She couldn't present herself in court. She couldn't touch other people because that would ruin their ability to be in the temple and worship God. She was isolated and alone because of this condition she had. And when she reached out and touched Jesus' cloak, what should have happened is Jesus becomes defiled, or at least his cloak does. And the woman is still defiled, and nothing changes. But because Jesus is Jesus, and he is God, for the first time that we... It's not the first time necessarily recorded, but in that story, this woman reaches out in hope and in faith that when she touches Jesus' cloak, maybe this time she will become cleansed and purified. Maybe this time she won't make something impure. And instead she'll be restored and given life again. And that's what we see happen in that story. But for the people of Israel here, this is not what's happening. So chapter 2 of Haggai, verse 14. Keep those two things in your mind. Nothing these people touch, because they're not Jesus, can become consecrated or holy. So the Haggai just posed these two hypotheticals. If something that's consecrated for God touches like meat or bread, does that be, the meat or the bread or the soup become consecrated? No. Now, if a person is defiled because, let's say, they touch a dead body, touches meat that is consecrated or uh, a priest, did that person become defiled? Yes. These are correct answers. Verse 14. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do... Whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came near to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from the, this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. So God was taking what happened that we saw in chapter 1, he was taking an extra step to explain what happened. The people had sinned. And because they didn't notice or they weren't paying attention or they weren't making right their heart before God, they were unable to even draw out the wine that they needed, which in that day was oftentimes the only good source of water that you could have access to sometimes. They couldn't draw out the grain that they needed to feed their family, so they were hungry. All of the work of their hand was cursed and would not work. So what about our mixed priorities? What happens when we sin? God doesn't necessarily work quite the same way that he used to. In the days of the prophets where a prophet would come, he would strike them with a a plague or um, famine or a drought, and then a prophet would come and say, listen, this is from God. It still could be. We just don't know. We don't have the same level of confidence that they would have when a prophet showed up and said, listen, I talked to God. He said, this is your fault and you need to fix it. But we still sin because we are still broken. And the sin corrupts and leads us astray. It causes us to mix up our priorities. Instead of always putting my family first, sometimes I put them second, third, or fifth. And sometimes you do the same. Sometimes when we make a mistake and we sin, we don't do the right priority thing of confessing that and trying to make it right. We ignore it or sweep it under the rug or hope it just never gets brought up again. Sometimes when we get into fights with someone that we love, like a spouse or a family member, because we're angry, we bring up something that we said we forgave them for and throw it back in their face and then hold them responsible for a sin they committed maybe even years ago that has long since been forgiven, long since been forgotten about, but you're mad and you just want to hurt the person because you're mad. We get our priorities mixed up all the time. And so what we need to do is get into a habit and practice of confession. Confessing our sins to one another, to God, to each other, to our spouses, our family, 
whomever, we must be in a habit of confessing our sins. You see, God had to show up in the book of Haggai to this people that he brought back from exile to give them another chance to bring them back to the land to establish the nation of Israel again. He brought them back, and these people who God chose to bring back, so he chose to call them again, who were likely going to not fall into idol worship, still had their priorities wrong. And they prioritized their own comfort and peace and safety over the honor and glory of God. So I want to read to you five verses from Psalm 34. The first five verses from Psalm 34. If you want to flip there, you can. But I just want to think about confession because confession is so important. And it's critical element. It is a critical element to our faith as Christians. Without it, we don't have a faith because we would never have admitted and asked for mercy and grace. Psalm 34, the first five verses. I will extol the, extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look, on, look to him are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. Look to God and turn to him. Because we are afflicted and cursed in our sin. But with God, we are not. Remember, Christ is eager to forgive. If only we would turn and confess our sin to the Lord and accept the forgiveness that he is offering. A forgiveness from God that is conditional. It's conditional on our repentance. Conditional on us saying, yes, I want to live a different way. I want to fix my priorities. I want to get things right. I don't want to hurt people anymore. I want to live to glorify you, Lord. And that's the only condition. A humble heart before God that says, yeah, I screwed up. And I can't do it without you. And that's what we saw from the people of Haggai. Because they humbled themselves before God and they obeyed the voice of their leaders. And they said, okay, yep, you're right. We got our priorities wrong. We're going to fix it now. They repented and they immediately started working on the temple. And so then God reminds them by saying, listen, when you did not have your priorities right, you defiled everything you touched. Your work didn't work. Your food wasn't growing. Your crops were not coming in. Your wine was not being made. And so even now, even though most, if not all of you in this room, have accepted Jesus as your Savior, we are still sinning because we are not complete yet. We're waiting for the return of Christ to come back and finish what he started. And so until that day comes there is still a need to seek forgiveness from each other and from the Lord, to continue to go to him for strength to resist temptation and sin, because God does not want us to continue to sin. Paul says it. He asked the rhetorical question in Romans 6. If sin means that there is now so much more grace than the sin, does that not mean we should continue to sin even more, so that there's even more grace. And Paul emphatically says, no, just do not even suggest that. That's not at all what you're supposed to do. You have died to sin. You were buried with Christ in his baptism and raised again from the dead like he was. How can you continue to sin? And so strive to resist sin. Seek to apologize when you're wrong. Have a humble heart and be willing to own up to your mistakes. Because that is how we glorify God. It is one way that we glorify God. It is not just in getting things right all the time. But it is also that when we get something wrong, we say, yep, that was my mistake. 
and I'm so sorry. How can I make this right? And that's my challenge. The challenge of Haggai and the challenge to us is when you make a mistake and your priorities are backwards, can you get it right? Can you fix it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to come to you today and and give thanks to you for all the ways you continue to bless us and challenge us and help us to grow. We ask that you would help us to learn to confess our sins and learn to overcome our weakness that we might become vessels that glorify you in this world. Lord, help us to never become so arrogant that we believe that if we own up to our mistakes that other people will think less of you. Humble us, Lord, and give us humility. Because it is through seeking to make things right that we will make this world a better place. Make us more like your son, Lord. Humble our hearts that we may be like you. This is your son's name we pray. Amen.